In this set of videos, we'll discuss time complexity analysis. In time complexity analysis, for a given algorithm or portion of code, we try to find the upper and lower bounds on the time complexity, and that is the number of operations that are necessary to complete the algorithm or code. When we do so, we must consider the set of all possible inputs of size n, and then we derive an expression for the runtime t of n, which is in terms of the input size n, and accounts for the number of steps or operations required to solve a problem on inputs of size n. Now, let's consider an example with this length list. So, for example, if we wanted to try find on a specific value, say find 3, if we looked at the head, we would already find 3. But then, you'll notice if we called find 2, we would actually have to traverse the entire list to find it. So, in some respects, we need to consider the input, but we also need to consider the size of the entire input problem. Now, in contrast, if we wanted to do something like pushback or append an element to the end of a linked list, we know we'd have to traverse the entire linked list in order to find the end, especially if it's a singly linked list and we don't have a tail pointer. Now, it may seem that this is entirely theoretical, but in fact, runtime analysis has very deep practical implications. And one example I like to give from my own experience is when I was a postdoc, my advisor needed results in order to find significant genetic locations for an experiment. Her graduate student had been running an algorithm for many weeks and there were no results. She desperately needed the results and she asked me to help the graduate student. So what I had done was I considered several algorithms that were available to us to solve this problem. And when I did the complexity analysis, I found out that the graduate student was not getting results in many weeks because he had been running a big O of N cubed algorithm, so a cubic algorithm. But we had an alternative algorithm available to us, which was O of N log N. And the drastic difference was because our data set had so many genetic locations to consider, so our N in this case was 50,000, I was able to find a solution the same afternoon and we were able to run our code on our data set and find a solution in three days, whereas the graduate student had been working for several weeks. Another really important practical aspect of complexity analysis is that we offer an abstraction for what a step or an operation is that's independent of any hardware that we run our code on or any system. So in some respects, complexity analysis gives us a way to have abstraction so that we can figure out how many resources our algorithm or code will take independent of the system on which it will be run. Okay. Now let's jump more into the details. Now one important thing to consider when we do complexity analysis is that we often have to consider case analysis. And what case analysis does is it tells you what input to consider when we're doing our runtime analysis for inputs of size n. So now, best case analysis is when we want to find an input of size n that takes the minimum amount of time. Now, best case analysis is not so widely used in practice, but it's useful to know what the best case is for an algorithm or code. Average case analysis, in this 
type of analysis, we consider the time required for all inputs of size n and then take their average. And this assumes a distribution over all inputs and most often the uniform distribution is quite reasonable for this. And the third and most common type of case analysis is worst case analysis. And for worst case analysis, we need to find an input of size n that takes the maximum amount of time. Now, worst case analysis is extremely useful in practice because it helps us discern how much resources our algorithm or code will ever need. So this is why we often plan with worst case analysis. And it really gives us a good indication of the scalability of our algorithm or code. Now, let's take a look at the steps for running our analysis. So when we want to conduct worst case runtime analysis for inputs of size n, our first step is going to be to think of at least one input of size n that will require the maximum runtime of the algorithm. Then, given such an input, we want to express the runtime of the algorithm on the input as a function of n, so we'll call that t of n. And then finally, once we have t of n in a closed form, we apply asymptotic notation to find the order of growth of the runtime of our function. Now, as a brief aside, let's review asymptotic notation. And one important distinction that we're making is that runtime complexity analysis uses asymptotic notation as a tool in order to tell us the growth of the runtime. These two concepts are often confounded, so we want to make it clear that asymptotic notation is a tool used in complexity analysis in order to determine the growth of our algorithm. Now, let's first review big O. We say that a function t of n is big O of f, n, of, f of n if there exist constants a and n naught such that for all n greater than n naught, t of n is bounded above by a times f of n, and this is less than or equal to, and the assumption, by the way, is we're assuming that t of n is non-negative. And if you prefer to use limit rules, this is the same as saying that t of n is big O of f of n if and only if the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of t of n divided by f of n is not equal to infinity. That means it can be a constant or it can be zero. We can think of big O as an upper bound on the growth of our function t of n. Now, t of n is said to be big omega of f of n if there exists constants a and n naught greater than zero such that t of n is greater than or equal to a times f of n. So that just means that the function f of n is a lower bound on the growth of t of n past a threshold of n naught. Now, in terms of a limit rule, this just means that the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of t of n divided by f of n is not equal to zero. So it can be infinite or it can be a constant. And so we can think of f of n as a lower bound of the growth of the function of t of n. Now finally, 
We say that T of n is theta of f of n if and only if it is big O of, n of f of n and big omega of f of n. And in terms of the limit rule, it just means that the limit of the ratio has to be a constant. So the limit as n goes to infinity of T of n divided by f of n is equal to some constant greater than zero. So this is just quickly to review asymptotic notation. Now, I want to make a clarification about what big O and big omega mean for worst case analysis. So big O just means that we have no inputs exceeding the bound. But for big omega, worst case just means there is at least one input requiring this bound for the worst case. So in order to find big omega for the worst case, we need to find an input that requires at least f of n steps. So let's consider an example now. Our example is the for loop that we have here. So we have an outer for loop which is going from i going to 0 for to n minus 1 and we have an if statement inside the for loop and the inner for loop going from j equal to 0 to n minus 1 and inside we're just updating the value of aij. Now if we ignore the if statement we're getting an upper bound on t of n. And when we do that, we'll see that we have n steps for the inner for loop in green, and we're doing each of those n steps for each of the iteration of the outer for loop in blue, so we'd say this will be big O of n squared for those nested for loops. However, if we want to get the lower bound, what we need to do is we need to think of one input that will require at least our bound. And here we're arguing for n squared as the bound, so we need to think of at least one input that will require the inner loop to run every time, the loop in green. So that input is a matrix that has every entry in the first column as zero. So, the, so to show what we're doing, there exists some input requiring n squared steps. Such an input is a matrix with all zeros in the first column. Such a matrix would always have the if statement in purple be true. So that means it would require at least n squared. That means it will run all the code of the inner for loop for every iteration of the outer for loops. That's where we get the big omega of n squared. And when that happens, when we find the upper bound, the big O and the big omega matching, we say that this portion of code is theta of n squared.